Hey everyone, welcome to Lunch with California Common Cause, um, our weekly opportunity to chat with our members and others interested in building a better, more inclusive California democracy. We've, we're grateful that you're here. I'm Jonathan Mentha Stein, the Executive Director at California Common Cause. Every week, every other week, we have a guest from the democracy space. Um, in the intervening weeks, i.e. today, I provide a solo update on what's going on in the democracy space in California. Um, we have a ton to get through today. I want to share a lot of major updates with you. Uh, if you have questions as we move through today, please feel to uh, please feel free to put those questions in the comments. Um, we have staff behind the scenes who are grabbing those questions and they're putting them where I can see them so I can answer them at the end. Before we jump into the updates, I just want to give you some housekeeping. Um, one, uh, our student organizing and activist retreats. Um, which are an annual retreat that we hold every year. We reach anywhere between 20 and 40 really wonderful young people um, to, to share about common cause issues and to provide them with the tools to be leaders in this space. Um, it's virtual this year. I've mentioned this in past weeks. Um, we're moving to a 100% virtual online format for the summer with multiple sessions over the course of the summer. If you have a, if you yourself are interested or if you have a young leader, a young activist, a young organizer in your life, please direct them to our website. Um, specifically, it's commoncause.org slash California slash student dash activism. Again, commoncause.org slash California slash student dash activism. And our staff can put that link in the comments. Um, another piece of housekeeping. We did several weeks of shows, over a month of shows at our YouTube channel, streaming live on YouTube instead of on Facebook. If you're interested in those, um, you can find uh, those at youtube.com backslash user backslash CA Common Cause TV. Um, alternatively, you can just go to YouTube and search for Common Cause TV. You can find it that way as well. And we'll post that link in the comments uh, in addition. Uh, there's lots of great content from past conversations with lots of fantastic guests. And so if you're interested, please do check that out. Okay, so what's going on um, this week and generally in the uh, democracy space? First, redistricting. Um, this week uh, was the first meeting or is the first meeting of the California Citizens Redistricting Commission. Um, the uh, Citizens Redistricting Commission was created back in 2008 with the support of California Common Cause, Legal Women Voters, and a number of others. Um, the first cycle was a smashing success, with, uh, really modeled for the nation what independent redistricting run by ordinary citizens can look like. And we're in the process of standing up the second commission for the second go around. Um, you've probably been hearing about our updates on selection process. The first eight commissioners of 14 have been selected and they started a meeting on uh, Tuesday. It's gonna be a three day meeting. It's actually ongoing right now. Um, and you can stream it at the state auditor's office website. Um, and uh, really the point of this week is just training giving them training on a variety of topics, but most importantly, preparing them to pick the six additional commissioners out of the pool of finalists um, to form a full commission of 14. Now, the key issue that maybe you've seen on social media, you've seen op-eds about this, is Latino underrepresentation. Uh, this is a dramatic, severe problem that has to be addressed. Uh, the final pool of 30 finalists, um, excuse me, the final pool of 35 finalists was 20% Latino. And yet in the random draw of the first eight commissioners, zero Latinos were selected. The odds of at least one Latino being selected was over 90% and it just didn't happen. Um, we have weighed in, uh, other partner organizations have weighed in a number of um, important critical, critically important voices from around the state have weighed in all calling for increased Latino representation. Um, and, and the commissioners have not just the opportunity to do that, but the legal obligation to do that. Because the law says that the first eight, when they're choosing the final six, have to choose the final six in a way that balances the diversity of the commission, gender, geographic, and racial and ethnic diversity, um, and also to balance the skills and experiences of the commissioners. Um, in this instance, so far, the most glaring, most obvious problem is the lack of Latino representation, an unacceptable outcome to this point, and one, thankfully, that can be addressed. Um, at the uh, first day of their uh, meeting this week, a number of entities, including Naleo and Common Cause, gave public comment 
calling for additional Latino representation. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about Naleo, the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, um, Naleo Education Fund, Educational Fund, um, you can go to our YouTube page where in a past week, I sat down with Rosalind Gold, their Chief Public Policy Officer, to talk about Latino voter participation, um, Latino civic engagement, and um, uh, redistricting as it impacts the Latino community. So Naleo and uh, California Common Cause and some others gave public comment yesterday, um, emphasizing the importance of Latino um, representation on the commission. Thursday, there's another opportunity for public comment, and I think many, many, many more organizations will be given similar public comment. I'm really happy to report that the commission yesterday spoke strongly in support of diversity. Um, and one of the commissioners said, I, you know, I'd like us to be on record to say what we believe about diversity and whether it's important to uh, prioritize uh, representation on this commission and to build a commission that looks broadly speaking like the state of California. And every single commissioner uh, across the, the three partisan subgroups, because you've got Democrats, you've got Republicans, and you've got people who are non, no party preference or other, every single commissioner um, spoke strongly in favor of, uh, of, of diversity and representation. Um, and uh, their process of selecting the next six commissioners begins on, on an August 4th meeting that is scheduled to go for days and days and days, basically for as long as they need to get the selection of the final six right. Um, and so uh, we're seeing a positive trend out of the commission to this point, but this is something we have to watch like hawks um, because it's a really, really um, important issue. And we want to build a commission that all California communities can see themselves in um, because they will be more willing to engage with the commission and they will trust the commission's work um, if they can see themselves in the commission and they know the commission reflects every community. Um, and the Latino community has, it has every right to see itself in this commission. It deserves to see itself in this commission. We have to make sure um, that the commission reflects everyone. Uh, so that's the update on redistricting, big things happening. Um, I wanna move to elections. Several things here on elections, one looking backward and two looking forward. Um, looking backward, yesterday we released a report on LA County's March 3rd presidential primary election. That report is called Problems and Promise, Assessing Los Angeles County's New Voting System Rollout in the March 2020 Primary Election. Uh, our staff member, Kiana Asamanfar, is the lead author of that report. Um, it turned out fabulous. It details findings from our poll monitors visits to more than 150 Los Angeles County vote centers on election day and in the early vote period. Um, you may recall news stories um, flooding uh, the, the airwaves uh, on election day and after election day about three hour lines in Los Angeles County and a variety of malfunctions that occurred there. Um, the report details all of that. And I'm gonna share a little bit of our findings now, in just a moment. You can find the full report on our Twitter or on our Facebook. Um, you're on Facebook now, so presumably you know how to find our Facebook page, but it's facebook.com slash common cause CA, um, you, or you can find it on our Twitter page at common cause CA. So um, the uh, new LA County voting system replaced a badly outdated voting system that had been in place for years. It was in need of replacement. Um, the program, uh, the new voting system was developed in a highly inclusive user-centered approach. Uh, the LA County uh, Elections Office did tons of community meetings, took tons of community input, um, and the system they came out with dramatically improves the voting experience for LA County voters if it works right. Uh, it offers early voting. It offers flexibility for voters to cast about at any voting location in the county. It offers a new modernized voting machine called a ballot marking device, a BMD, that has new accessibility features for voters with disabilities and voters with language needs. They rolled out uh, flexible voting centers or temporary voting centers to put a voting site in communities that might need extra support. They unveiled 24 hour voting centers uh, close to election day so that people could have all hours access. They really had the best of intentions. Um, and yet there were critical problems on election day on March 3rd um, with the first use of the system. Um, I, I wanna come to one major problem which was the lack of vote by mail ballots for every voter in, in LA County. Um, but I'm gonna hold that to the end. Um, the findings of our report include technological problems with the e-poll books used to check in voters and with those voting machines known as ballot marking devices. I wanna be clear, there was no hacking. Um, the systems were secure. They just did not work as intended or as smoothly as intended. And the poll workers, um, vote center workers, 
were less familiar than they should have been with the new technology. There was resource allocation issues. Some vote centers were too small for the voter load that occurred there. Some were large enough, but didn't have enough voting machines or some were large enough and had enough machines, but didn't have enough staff. Um, uh, some were just, there was, there was odd locations of, now elections offices always have a hard time finding um, voting sites that meet ADA requirements, meet the technological requirements, are open for the, set, the right number of days, for the right number of hours. It's not easy work by any stretch of the imagination, but in some communities you had too many voting sites that weren't really used, and in other communities you had not enough voting sites, and the voting sites that were there were overloaded. Some vote centers didn't have sufficient parking, or it wasn't clear that parking was free. And the county system for troubleshooting and resolving problems were totally overwhelmed by what they experienced on March 3rd. Um, some poll workers reported that they were on hold with the county helpline for an hour or more, and many problems just went unfixed or went unfixed for hours or days. And all of this built to multi-hour lines at the end of election day, three, four-hour lines um, in some places as at the close of election day. So our report highlights the um, best of intentions that were brought to uh, LA County elections. It details all the problems I just outlined and more. And it also adds 36 recommendations for how LA County can fix these problems before the November election and beyond. I'll say two things. One, um, two last things on this. One, LA County has recognized these issues. They have not been shy about admitting fault. Um, and they have themselves put out a report on everything they're doing to fix these problems. And they're already working on them. So um, in keeping with the voter-centered approach they took to designing the voting system, they have really, um, they have one, accepted responsibility, and two, they have dived in, dove in, they have dove in um, to solutions. Um, and and um, we will be in LA County vote centers in November, uh, checking to see if these problems are in fact resolved. The other thing that has to be flagged is that in LA County, unlike every other Voters Choice Act County, not uh, it was not the case that every voter was sent a vote by mail ballot. So what do I mean by this and why is this important? Um, as I've discussed in previous um, episodes of the show, um, California unveiled something called the Voters' Choice Act, which is a new modernized um, voting system that includes early voting, flexible voting, more ways, more days to vote. Um, some counties, 15 counties specifically, have opted into um, the system to this point. Five started in November, uh, sorry, five started in 2018, um, and now we're up to 15 in 2020. LA County is one of the counties that has moved into the Voters' Choice Act approach of the Voters' Choice Act model, but they're the one county that was not required by law to send every single voter a vote by mail ballot. The idea behind the Voters' Choice Act is that you provide fewer voting locations that provide more services. And to make up for the fact that you're reducing the number of voting sites, you send every single voter a vote by mail ballot. So in this way, every single voter has a vote by mail ballot, they can vote it by mail, they can drop it off at a series of drop boxes around the county. They can drop it off at a vote center additionally, or they can vote in person at one of these fewer locations that have expanded services. Um, LA County uh, has the lowest rates of voting by mail uh, and has the largest population, it's 10 million people. As a result, the law gave LA County a carve out that did not require them to send a vote by mail ballot to every um, voter in the county. I think that has proven to be an obvious mistake um, by, by all parties. Um, and the LA County uh, Board of Supervisors moved almost immediately after the March 3rd election um, to change the law themselves so that in November, every LA County voter will receive a vote by mail ballot like everyone else in California in November. Okay, um, so that's the, um, the report. Again, the report is called Problems and Promise assessing Los Angeles County's new voting system rollout in the March 2020 primary election. Please do go check it out um, and if you want more detail. Um, next, we are doing research on um, voting systems, excuse me, on, on um, voter messaging. Um, so we're changing a lot about uh, elections in November. If you're watching this feed right now, you probably know this. We've talked about it in past shows. Um, uh, but elections are going to be different because of executive orders by the governor and by legislation coming out of the legislature. So we have been doing research with the Center for Social Innovation at UC Riverside to um, identify the messages that work best uh, for voters from different communities. We helped lead seven focus groups in six languages 
English, Spanish, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Korean, Tagalog, Filipino, and Hmong. Um, and our findings are being drafted now and we're hoping to come out with those by the end of the month. And then lastly, on the subject of elections, I want to share with you that yesterday, the Secretary of State in California came out with a 50 page directive um, for county elections officials and for election workers on ensuring public health and safety in election operations and in voting locations in the November election. And I wanna share a few of the findings there with you um, in just a moment. Uh, so the, um, uh, the, the report, the, the directive was developed in collaboration with public health officials and it, it requires the following. First and foremost, county elections officials are required to offer training on COVID safety to all of their staff. Employees at central facilities have to be screened for temperature and symptoms at the beginning of every shift. Workers who are sick or exhibiting symptoms are required to stay home. Um, counties are to have all voting locations deep cleaned before, during, and after the November 3rd, 2020 general election. Voting equipment in those voting locations has to be cleaned frequently. Some of it has to be cleaned between every use, between every voter. This will slow down voting and it will lead to longer lines. So if you want to limit the, um, if you want to avoid lines, and frankly, if you want to avoid any possible COVID exposure, you can vote by mail um, or you can vote early. Uh, as we've discussed in previous shows, the California via executive order and via legislation will be sending every single voter a vote by mail ballot for the November election, which means you can vote at home, put it in the mail or drop it at a drop box. Um, or every, as we've also noted in previous shows, every voting site in California will be open for a minimum. Well, I'll take this back. Um, many voting sites in California will be open for a four day early vote period. And you can vote during that early vote period when tr voter traffic is much lower and polling locations will be um, considerably more empty. Okay, the directive has a lot on PPE, um, face coverings, i.e. masks, gloves and other protective gear must be provided um, by the counties to county elections employees and to election workers. Masks, disposable masks must be offered to voters. So we're already hearing that the Secretary of State is in the process of ordering millions of masks and we'll be distributing them to voting sites. And so you will have, voters will be able to get a mask um, upon entering any polling place in California in November. There will be signs asking voters to wear masks and to maintain social distancing um, at every voting site. They'll be translated into every applicable language for every county and there'll be hand sanitizer at every voting site. So there's gonna be lots of safety precautions taken and lots of PPE. A huge part of this directive is dedicated to the subject of what to do with voters who refuse to wear a mask. Um, now, this is super tricky, right? Uh, do you want to turn people away because they're not wearing a mask? Um, does the fact that you have masks on hand that they can easily access impact your decision? The Secretary of State has come to the conclusion that they cannot turn someone away. They cannot turn someone away if a voter is not wearing a mask. Um, here's a direct quote from the, the directive. Election workers must not turn away a voter, excuse me, restart. Election workers must not turn a voter away for lack of face covering. The right to vote takes precedence, end quote. So the um, solution provided by the elections, um, by the Secretary of State is simply, you know, move a voter who refuses to wear a mask through the process as quickly as possible. Try to emphasize social distancing. If you have to have them um, sort of off on their own in their own space, um, you're able to do that though. That may cause a certain amount of concern by the person and themselves. Um, the directive really emphasizes confrontations don't serve anyone well. Um, we've all seen the scenes at stores and grocery stores and Walmarts and wherever where people who are refusing to wear a mask um, create an incident uh, that then gets goes viral um, and, and so on. It creates one, a really disruptive environment um, in a grocery store, let alone a polling place. Two, it makes harder for other voters to vote. Three, it contributes to the spread of um, the virus uh, if it's in the air um, because of shouting. Um, and, and frankly, our poll workers, are their jobs are hard enough as it is. It's going to be harder in a COVID environment, and they should not have to be bouncers. Um, it sounds like election workers will be trained in de-escalation, but frankly, they are not equipped to handle um, uh, uh, 
an outburst um, or a confrontation with someone who refuses to wear a mask. There's lots of instruction in the directive about this subject. And so ultimately it looks like the, um, the plan will be to have masks available to everyone, to have plenty of signage um, that indicates that people should wear masks. But if someone does not wear a mask, they will be given the right to vote. Um, and they will be moved through the voting system as quickly as possible. This does raise a question of whether people can go into voting sites without wearing a mask in order to deter others from voting. Um, uh, and that's something that we're gonna have to grapple with and think more about between now and November. Um, and, and how do we wanna protect voters um, who might be intimidated by people who go into voting sites without wearing a mask on purpose in order to cause disruption. And these are things that we are gonna have to think about as advocates for voters. Okay, so that's it um, on uh, the Secretary of State's 50 page directive on public health and public safety in um, voting sites. Um, I would encourage you to ask any questions that you might have um, in the comments. Um, uh, that's the updates I have for you on redistricting and on voting today. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll have more uh, in coming weeks. I'm 100% I'm, I'm certain that this will be a topic worth following in coming weeks. Um, before we go to questions, I want to encourage you to follow us on our social media. On Twitter, we're at Common Cause CA. I'm on Twitter at, at underscore Jonathan Stein. Um, on Facebook, you can follow us facebook.com slash common cause CA. Um, please remember that we're, we're here every single week um, with a lunch with, with California Common Cause, Wednesdays at noon Pacific. Next week, we will be joined by Dan Newman, the executive director of MapLight, an organization in Berkeley that shines light on money and politics, and the author of Unrig, um, a, um, a new book, uh, on how to fix our broken democracy. And what's really awesome about this book is that it's a graphic novel um, that goes through um, money in politics, um, voting, redistricting, the history of um, the fight for voting in the civil rights movement. Um, it really is an exceptional uh, book um, about um, our history um, and the current day challenges around building a better democracy. Um, and I've started reading it. It's a blast. I really, really enjoy it. Um, and I helped consult with Dan on some of the voting sections. Um, so uh, tune in next Wednesday um, uh, at noon. Uh, we'll be joined by Dan to talk about his great new book. Um, uh, it looks like we have no questions at this time. Um, and so we're going to wrap things up. Um, as always, we appreciate you and your support of California Common Cause. Thanks for being in the fight with us. Um, and thanks for joining us um, for our weekly live stream. Uh, we'll see you next week.